Hello, welcome to another 10 minute topic. Today we're going to be talking about hyponatremia. So this is the first of uh, two video lectures we'll do on this topic. So today we're going to cover the general approach and the second talk will be applying what we do today into some case-based studies. So the aims of this particular talk are to help you develop a system to differentiate and identify causes of hyponatremia. And after that, uh, hopefully we can understand the basic lab tests involved. So some useful points before we get cracking on the three-step system. So just some numbers around 15 to 30 percent, depending on which study you read, um, of inpatients will have a mild hyponatremia. And around 1 to 4 percent will have a moderate or severe. We'll talk about the thresholds um, on the next slide. So most cases of hyponatremia are mild and asymptomatic, and I'm sure this is reflected in your own clinical practice. And again, often resolves without any action. So especially in the mild cases, leaving things alone can sometimes do the trick, but not always. When there are symptoms, these tend to be mainly neurological, so dizziness, confusion, nausea, headache. And then when we're getting to the more severe part of the spectrum, reduced GCS, seizures and coma. So your first step is to decide, is this acute and as it, is it severe? So your normal range of sodium is 135 to 145 millimoles per litre. So mild is between 130 and 134. Moderate is down to 125. And then severe is less than 125. More importantly, perhaps, is deciding whether it's acute, uh, whether it's um, acute and severe. So acute is happening within less than 48 hours, although some sources will say less than 24 hours. But I'd go with 48. If there's severe symptoms, so seizures, um, reduced GCS or sleepiness and uh, coma, then you'll need to initiate emergency management. Okay, and we'll go through one of these in the next video. And this, this is the point where really, instead of following an algorithm, you want to escalate, seek help. If you're mild symptoms, go on to step two. Chronic cases, more than 48 hours. So the basic premise of the first step really is to decide, is this patient safe to carry on being investigated at a normal pace or do they need emergency treatment and to be moved to somewhere like intensive care immediately? And do I need to get my consultant involved? So why does this matter? So acute electrolyte and water shifts can't be compensated. Yeah, that's what it's sodium, potassium, calcium, whatever. So if you look at the diagram on the right hand side of the slide, you can see your normal brain and then what happens when you've got too much fluid on board. And this is what happens in hyponatremia. So you get cerebral edema. With chronic hyponatremia, like with other chronic conditions, the body's able to compensate for this and reduces your risk of acute edema. Now with very low sodium, of course, patients can still get neurological symptoms if it's chronic, but in acute, there just isn't the time for this. The brain swells and you get severe problems and death. At this point, it's also worth remembering the effects of shifting your sodium a bit too quickly the other way, which is central pontine myelinolysis. So rapid shifts in either direction, up or down, of your electrolytes will have consequences. And that's why acute hyponatremia is of concern. So we've decided whether it's acute and whether it's severe, decided to keep on the algorithm instead of escalating, and we'll go on to step two. So you're going to assess your patient and especially their volume status. So history, you want to think about their symptoms, as we've already described, and how they relate to their, um, their admission. You know, do they come in with falls and dizziness or anything else that we mentioned? And also whether they've had any history of hyponatremia previous episodes. Past medical history, think about anything that can cause SIADH, cancers, tuberculosis, that sort of thing. Other conditions, hypothyroidism. There's a whole list that we'll go through. And it's worth looking at their drug history as well. Lots of drugs can cause hyponatremia. 
the most commonly known ones or remembered ones are diuretics, antidepressants and carbamazepine, but there's a very long list so it's always worth checking your drug list. And we'll move on to the examination and look at that all important volume status. So I've got a bit of a list here. So JVP, I get the patient lying down 45 degrees, looking in one corner of the room, look at their neck. Can you see that pulse risen above the normal level? Membranes, have a look inside the mouth, of the, into the mucous membranes, the lips, the tongue. Do they look crispy and dry or do they look well hydrated? In a similar vein, skin turga, have a, a pinch of the skin, not too hard of course, and see whether you, the, the skin looks dehydrated, whether you get that mark left after you've taken your hand away, as you can see in B of the two pictures there. Listen to their chest, listen for any crackles, and the lying and standing blood pressure, really important to make sure there's no postural drop. And then looking for edema, so you can have a look at the legs, have a look at the abdomen as well for ascites and so on. So we've got our first basic diagram here. I'm not going to dwell on this for too long. I'd advise pausing the slide and just having a look through it. But essentially what this tells you is that the three different volume levels, so normal volume, too much volume or too little volume, will signify different causes. We'll go through this again at the end of the lecture. And then your third step is to do your lab tests. So you've got your basics, full blood count, use and ease, LFTs, thyroid, lipid profile, cortisol and glucose. The all important ones, the osmolality, urine osmolality and the sodium. And we'll go through these in the next slide. And think about your other tests as well. Do you need to image their head? looking for causes of SIADH? Uh, do you need to do an X-ray, synaclin tests for, um, for steroid problems, urine potassium, other renal tests? You know, there's all these other things to think about. The main tests, though, are the biochemistry tests. So the plasma osmolality tells you the concentration of solutes in the plasma. In most cases, the patients are hypotonic, i.e. their plasma is dilute. So hyper or isotonic cases come under a, a bit of a separate umbrella, which we'll look at in a second. Urine sodium normally is over 20 in uvolemic cases. And in hypo and hypervolemic cases, the urine sodium can help differentiate renal or extra renal causes. And so it's a really crucial test because it, if you think about your algorithms, it's one of the main branching points is based on the urine sodium. And finally, the urine osmolality. This tells you the ability of the kidneys to concentrate urine and is especially useful for diagnosing SIADH. So as I alluded to before, your amount of fluid on board is important. And this is one of the main reasons why it is looking for these, these weird causes of hyponatremia, almost like lab artifacts. So pseudo hyponatremia can be caused by high lipids or proteins. So think about your case patients with hyperlipidemia, with myeloma, high protein levels, and it's a lab artifact from diluting the samples. With these cases, the sodium will be normal on a blood gas, so it's worth doing. And the plasma osmolality for these cases will be isotonic. Hyperglycemia, so think about your diabetic states, will cause water retention. In this case, the plasma osmolality is hypertonic because of all that glucose. If you've got someone who's really unwell with a hyperglycemic state, just consider that their glucose correction needs to be slow and steady to prevent uh, overly fast sodium drops. So this is the main diagram that we're going to use. Uh, so again, worth pausing and having a look at this. So if we start at the top, done step one, and you've decided you're going to follow the algorithm, this is most likely going to be a, a chronic case. And you've decided it's not too severe. So let's have a look. You, um, you've assessed your patient, decided on their volume status, and you've sent off the lab tests and 
got your osmolality back. So if we look at the branch points here, again, we can see the isotonic ones on the left hand side is pseudohyponatremia, so lipid states and protein states. If we look on the right hand side, your hypertonic hyponatremia, that tends to be hyperglycemia. Other causes can be if you've already given hypertonic saline, for example, or the use of drugs like mannitol. In the center, we've got the vast majority hypotonic, so that plasma osmolality is less than 280. And you've already done your volume status and narrowed it down to whether it's hypo, euvolemic, or hypervolemic. And we can see here, this is where the urine sodium comes in. Okay, I'm not going to go through every single cause, but we will look at these a lot more in the next talk. But this is the algorithm I would generally tend to use. It helps you hone down the list of causes fairly quickly and you can start to think about treatment at this point. Let's do a quick recap. So we've looked at step one, decide on severity and acuity. And if it's severe at this point, you come off any algorithm and you escalate, speak to your boss and start emergency treatment. Step two is you're gonna assess your patient and look at their volume status. And three, you're gonna do your lab tests, including those all important biochemistry tests. And at the same time, exclude those pseudo or glycemic causes. So these should allow you to follow the hyponatremia algorithm safely and identify your common causes pretty quickly. There are always rare causes which will require specialist input, but do remember when you're starting out with these patients that triad of volume status, serum osmolality or plasma osmolality, and urine sodium. And then we'll have a look a bit further in the next cases in the next talk. Yes. And so I've just added on this final learning point um, for this talk, really to re-emphasize what was said at the beginning, which is not all cases need to be investigated. So if the hyponatremia is mild and the patient is well, then it's most likely going to be self-limiting. The really important point is that not everyone needs the SIADH screen. There's a lot of these done and most of the time the patient won't have it. So you really need to look at the volume status and think about what is the likely cause. If SIADH is a possibility, then of course send the screen, but don't just send it blindly. And we'll look at some case studies in the next talk to really look into this further.